All right, so first um, we'll start by introducing ourselves. Um, I was thinking that my team could introduce ourselves and then um, each one of you could give like a short name, um, pronouns, um, and like why you're here today or just any short of short introduction. Um, so my name is Ayana Ishimura. I'm a senior at Mount Desert Island High School in Bar Harbor, Maine, um, and the co-president of the eco team here. I was also one of the summer interns for Climate to Thrive this past summer, which I'll talk about more later. Um, I've been on the eco team for the past four years, so since I was a freshman, and it has drastically changed my life. Um, I grew up learning about deforestation and climate change through my grandmother, so I've always been passionate about the environment, but being a part, being a part of my community, of a community like my eco team and a climate to thrive has given me a lot of confidence and hope in my actions. Um, and it's also taught me how important it is to really connect, communicate, collaborate um, with so many people to combat the climate crisis. So I'm so excited to be able to connect with all of you today. Um, and thank you so much for being here. Um, I'll pass it on to Ruby. Hi, I'm Ruby and my pronouns are she, her, and I'm a junior um, at MDI High School. And I am also a member of the eco team and I was an intern at the Climate to Thrive this summer. And I've worked with various local and national political and climate justice organizations, including the Sunrise Movement. Um, and I was a volunteer for the re-election campaign of um, the co-author of the Green New Deal, Ed Markey, um, in 2020. And yeah, climate action is very important to me and it's a super integral part of what I do. And I'm super psyched to be here with all of you today. And should I pass to someone? <laughs> um, is Joe here or? So Joe lost power and he was calling in, but it looks like he just dropped off. So um, maybe we can all, all just go around and introduce ourselves quickly while we wait for him to rejoin. I'm Gary Friedman uh, in Bar Harbor and um, one of the co-founders of A Climate to Thrive and, um, and has helped start the internship program at MDA High School. So I'm really excited about the work that um, Ayano and Ruby and others at the high school have done and, and looking forward to hearing your presentation. Thanks, Gary. Um, Mark, do you wanna introduce yourself next? Sure, I'm uh, Mark Connolly, he, him, and uh, I've lived here in Blue Hill for uh, a couple of years now, I got sort of caught by the virus, Corona, and I was uh, going to live seasonally between here and Portsmouth, Virginia. I've been a Sierra Club member since 73, a life member since 75, and I thought that I'd try to find out more about the solar issue here in Maine, which I think is an interesting issue for us to all be concerned about, and uh, renewables, the accessibility of renewables for our energy consumption and that sort of thing. So it's, it's an item of interest for me. And I'll pass. Um, thank you so much, Mark. Um, do you wanna pass it on to someone or does anyone wanna to volunteer to go next? Oh, Nancy? It looks like you're unmuted. I'm Nancy Chandler, currently a school board member in MSAD 75 Topsom. We have a new high school with uh, all with solar and geothermal, and we're trying to persuade them to. I'm on the energy team for a committee for for Topsom. We're trying to persuade them to to use the current 45 uh, percent uh, grants for electric school buses to, to go ahead and invest and start investing in the fleet of the future. Um, so I've been a Sierra Club member also since 73 and been what, doing things with the climate action teams, weatherizing houses in Phippsburg. So looking forward to hearing what you young people have been up to. 
and I'm the other Nancy, Nancy Anderson, she and her, and I am a grandma, very concerned about climate change, have been involved with a, a number of organizations and political campaigns, excited about what you all have done and excited about decentralized generation of power. Want to learn more about what you're doing. I am Rachel Grady. I am a social studies teacher at Gorham High School, and we were so fortunate to meet Joe and uh, Ayano and, and other students who spoke about their solar experiences as Gorham is trying to move in that direction. So I am at school, and we are barely, you know, <laughs> at school with the number of uh, quarantining days that have, have hit us. So um, forgive the math, but uh, anyway, it's good to be safe. So thank you all for, for putting this on. And also I have to log um, by 1240 because I have students coming in. So uh, just to let you know in advance. Go ahead, Ellen. Thank you. Hi, I'm Ellen Dakotis. And um, right now I'm on the school board in which is the Buxton uh, Dandish area. And um, we've been talking a little bit about uh, trying to reduce the cost of uh, heating for the building with all the budget cuts that are happening. And um, now, so they're not interested in the solar panels because they're indicating um, that there's a problem with the PFAS that uh, are coming from the solar panels. So I wanted to come today to hear what your presentation is and hopefully bring back some new information to the school board and see if we can put these on some of our school buildings. Thank you. Can I go? Hi, I'm Samantha. So um, I live in Camden and uh, much like Mark uh, was a vacation place that has turned into our forever home thanks to COVID and of all the things that came out of the past year, I'm very, very, very happy to be here. We were living in New York before. I have two children in the Camden Rockport Elementary School and um, I always have been, but largely now because of them, I'm very passionate about climate change and renewable energy. And um, I, I'm just excited to hear what you've done at Mount Desert Island. And I have no idea what they're doing in Camden. I feel like it's a fairly forward thinking community in um, climate regards, but I don't know what's going on here. Like I said, I'm new. So I'm just um, information gathering. Thank you for putting this on. Guess I can go next. Um, my name is Mike Schreimeyer. I'm a Sierra Club member as of Friday, so new to this. Um, I'm a mechanical engineer working at IDEX, so I'm definitely a pretty big nerd about anything technology related. Um, thanks. Um, I'm an Eagle Scout, so that's kind of where I became really passionate about the environment and um, enjoying nature and wanting to preserve it. Um, the first job I had out of uh, college, I was working at a company that made semiconductor manufacturing equipment and we made um, instrument or tools that could make solar panels. So I'm somewhat familiar with um, the construction of solar panels from like a very detailed technical standpoint. Um, my wife and I bought a house in Portland about three years ago and like the first thing we did was have uh, solar panels put up on our roof. So we're excited to have that and a all electric Nissan Leaf and trying to reduce our carbon footprint. So this, um, the title of this talk kind of piqued my interest. I Joe, think I think you might be the last one if you can, if you're able to talk. Sure, I am. I've been listening, I, it cut out at one point. I'm um, in Bernard, um, my name is Joe Blotnick. I was the co-coordinator of a climate to thrive, a nonprofit uh, on MDI that set a, a goal five years ago of energy independence by 2030. 
and since then that's become a, a very important date for many other uh, places. Um, and I am currently without power, so I'm on the phone. <laughs> um, the I'll I'll say a, a little bit more after the rest of my team here with the uh, students introduce themselves. So, yeah. Um, Joe, we already yeah. introduced ourselves, but um, I would just like to say um, we also have one other member who is a very new member to our team, um, and she will probably join later on for the Q&A for questions. Um, her name is Austria, but she'll also be here as yeah. well. Okay, um, great. Yeah, Anya, do you think you could share your screen again? Yeah. I think, Joe, you're the next slide. Okay. Uh, since I can't see the slides because I have no internet access, <laughs> um, you could just tell me where I'm at. <laughs> uh, yeah, so, oh, go ahead. We're at the um, 76 solar installs doubling MDI's capacity. Okay, great. Yeah, let me, okay, great. Let me just say a little bit more. I, I you know, we're talking about telling short stories of how we got involved in all of this. And it occurred to me just before the call that back in 1970, the very first Earth Day, I was a junior in high school and our teacher, science teacher said, oh, today is Earth Day. And we're all, you know, what's Earth Day? You know, what's that? And she says, well, and I, I lived in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And she says, well, it's about pollution and all this kind of stuff. And we're like, what's pollution? And, and she says, well, if you look out the window, and we were up on a hill in this high school, you could see that we're having an inversion today and the air is very brown. And I looked and I saw the brown air and I hadn't really realized that our sky is often brown because Pittsburgh was a very polluted place um, at the time. And prior to that, it was horrible. Um, but the good news is that got me into the environment and I ended up studying the environment as the director of environmental aid centers and been working with the environment all my life. And back then we weren't thinking about climate change. We were just talking about pollution. The good news is during the seventies, our country made a tremendous uh, strides in, in reducing pollution such that there's probably less pollution in a lot of ways today than there were there, not in all cases, of course, there's a lot of toxics out there. But, um, and so I'm, I'm hopeful about climate change as well. And it's so awesome to be working with young people in high school that uh, see that, yes, we can do this too, we can make a change. So uh, a climate kind of the tribe uh, began just five years ago and we, you know, one of the first things we wanted to do is increase the solar on the island. So we did a solarized program where we worked with uh, Revision Energy and we offered a little bit of a discount to homeowners and businesses that wanted to go solar. And on the next slide there, you could see that we had 76 uh, installs all around the island. Uh, 76 people signed up to put solar on, including ourselves. Um, and we doubled the amount of solar capacity on the island in that one summer there, or summer and fall. Uh, and that was really great because, you know, people have been putting solar panels on intermittently here and there for like 25 years. Well, we doubled it. Um, and just to say that somebody mentioned heating, the solar panels on our roof are heating our house through heat pumps, heating our hot water through a hot water heater, providing all of our electricity, and we have access to generate extra power for my son's home in Southwest Harbor. So it's, it's amazing to be able to do that. Um, so the next step for Climate Thrive is we wanted to double the energy again, so the solar energy on the island. And so we looked at bigger projects and we found a, um, a septic system, I mean, septic, a landfill in Tremont that was capped and everything. It wasn't going to be used for anything else. There's a bench up there that you could walk up to and sit in the sun. Um, and so we ended up uh, getting a working to get 
a solar array put on that landfill, about half of the space there, and it provides the power to the elementary school in Tremont and all of the town buildings. And currently, we're working on putting a community solar farm on the other half. And then after that, we looked at the high school, and both the principal and the superintendent were very uh, open to solar, uh, and they wanted to do it. But as you know, um, administrators in schools are extremely busy. They've got so many other things to do. So as a nonprofit, I was able to devote my time and, and a few others and our volunteers and our energy committee and so forth um, and uh, our board to work with the high school to actually just basically do the process of, of figuring out how much energy they used, uh, doing a request for proposals, selecting a vendor and so forth and making the recommendations to the board of trustees. And so um, we were able to go 100% solar. At the time, it was gonna save the high school, projected to save the high school 200 and $50,000 over 25 years. Um, the panels would probably last for more than 25 years, but that's what you're looking at. And and even though that's not a lot of money, if you divide at $10,000 a year, that's not a lot of money. Um, but when the new legislation that came in with the Mills administration, which we helped as an organization to envision and, and to get passage of, um that number the numbers of net metering change so that now it's estimated that we're going to save 1.5 million and i'd say that's a low estimate uh and that is significant money that the school can use to educate people which is what they're all about so um there you go and if you let me know what other slide i'm on uh i could talk more yeah, so the next one is on the uh, 2019 interns. Uh, yes, yeah, the 2019 interns. Yeah, we, we one of the things that we did is we started an internship pr program in the summer for high school students and or college students that had graduated from MDI High. And, um, we had two the first year, then three, then five, and I think in 2019 we had five. And we did a lot of things around solar energy, including going down to the state house and talking to the Senate president and Sarah Gideon uh, about, you know, climate change and so forth. Um, we've done that in a number of years. And, and the uh, interns got to go over to, I think it's Pittsfield, where there's a really large solar array where Janet Mills signed into legislation three new um, solar bills that were going to really greatly expand solar, as you know, in the state. And um, the a couple of those people that are <laughs> young folks that are jumping up in front of the state house uh, are Thomas Corsanje and Soroki Kumar. And uh, those two got really excited about the solar uh, project going on at the high school and ended up writing a white paper that we can provide to everybody here about the project so that they could share it with other schools uh, around the state and country, actually. It was, a, they got a $500 grant to write this paper in the following year. And then I think we can go on to the next slide where uh, I believe Ayano is going to speak about this project. I think um, this is the ribbon cutting slide. Yeah. Oh, yes. Oh, that was so, the movie. Wasn't it? Yes. So once um, once we had the solar panels installed um, and they were all ready to go, there was um, a ribbon cutting ceremony that was organized by former Climate to Drive interns um, and members of the eco team at FDI. Um, and local and statewide press was invited and Sarah Gideon made a lovely speech. Um, and after the presentation, the press was super focused on the kids, um, all of the former interns and the eco team members. Um, and so Thomas, who, like Joe said, was one of the former interns, um, he actually, um, a couple of days later, as he was driving to school, 
um, he turned on his car radio and he was able to hear his own voice because the main public radio had done a four minute segment um, on the project and that was super cool. Uh, and then I think we can go to the next slide. And so also, as Joe mentioned, um, Sorohi and Thomas wrote a white paper that has all sorts of really great information. Um, but some of the highlights are that MBI will save $1.5 million over the next 25 years. Um, we'll reduce our carbon emission by 252 tons. Um, we were able to install almost 1,500 solar panels, which is super awesome. Uh, next, please. And uh, another great uh, feature of having solar is the output monitor that displays the power generated every day, week, month, etc. cetera. Um, and we have saved over um, 865,000 pounds of CO2 um, from entering the atmosphere, which is the equivalent of planting um, 6,500 trees, um, which is super cool. Sorry, yes? Sorry, I thought Joe said something. That's it. <laughs> um, next slide. Ruby, did you want me to show the video on the last slide showing like the overall project? Oh, yes. Yeah, sorry, I forgot about that. No, no, you're all set. Yeah. Yeah, so here's just a drone footage of all the solar panels installed. And those solar panels are what cover 100% of our school's electricity, which is awesome. All right, so, um, again, um, so up until now has mostly been about how MDI and like our specific high school went solar. Um, and as mentioned before, um, I had the pleasure of being an ACT intern this past summer along with Ruby. And it was a truly amazing experience. Um, like even through like wearing masks and screens and even though it was all virtual, we were still able to work on many exciting and incredible projects. Um, one of them being of course, um, one of the biggest projects Ruby and I worked on which was um, promoting solar energy to schools across the state. Um, so the former ACT interns, um, Thomas and Sarohi, they worked on the solar white paper and um, pushing solar for our, our, um, our school at MDI. But the, this project um, last summer that Ruby and I worked on was more, uh, we emailed, we, we reached out to schools across Maine and urged them to consider benefits of solar um, and those benefits, including like environmental benefits as well as um, financial benefits for the schools, especially considering like the effects of COVID um, and how COVID has financially affected and impacted a lot of schools in Maine. Um, so because as Ruby mentioned, the process of going 100% solar was relatively easy, straightforward and cost effective for our school. Um, we thought why not replicate the process for other schools. So we started out by finding all the high schools in Maine, which turned out to be around like 180 schools. And we emailed each of their principals with some info about our work and the benefits of solar. And then um, from the schools that replied, um, we scheduled Zoom meetings with them and met with each of the schools that showed interest. Um, and honestly, it was handy that everything was being done virtually over Zoom because that allowed us to connect with so many people um, from across the state. And um, if you go on the next slide, um, you can see the impact we had. So we contacted 180 schools across the state um, and then re received emails from around 20, 21 ish um, schools. Um, and then right now, um, currently there are 13 schools that are seriously considering solar energy and 
um, that we've met and Zoomed with and talked about um, how to lead their process on. And although like 13 schools doesn't seem like a lot compared to 180 schools, that would um, be like a ballpark equivalent to like 3,250 metric tons of um, reduction in carbon emissions, which is amazing. Um, and that estimate just comes from um, how much our school saved. Um, I just thought that, would, that was interesting to throw in. And if you go on the next slide, um, here, here's just a map of the schools that we have been working closely with um, oh, since the summer, since our internship in the summer, um, including Gorham High School, um, which um, Rachel is, uh, we've been working with Rachel with that, um, who's here today. And yeah, this just shows how like, how we've been connecting with schools from all over the state. It's really cool. And ever since um, the summer, our eco team at MDI has taken this project on because we, um, since our internship ended, we knew that this project would be like a large scale long-term project. So we wanted to keep it going somehow. And um, Ruby and I are kind of the leaders of that for um, our eco team right now. Um, next slide, please. So this last part of our presentation is about how your school can go solar. Um, and, or like if you have friends or family who may be interested in leading this, um, you could relay this information or contact us. Um, and I just wanted to share with you like the four basic first steps that you can take. Um, and I'll talk about the two, first two steps and then Ruby can talk about the third one and then Joe can talk about the fourth one. So the first step is um, getting an approval from the school, either the school principal, school board, um, or superintendent. And this is a really important step because um, without like a general approval of solar energy from an authority, um, it'd be really difficult to move a process all, this process along. But I think like the what we've found is like the most effective argument is the financial benefits of solar um, because um, like I feel like like school principals and the school board really cares about budget and when people hear about solar in their head they're like oh that's like a huge upfront cost but at MDI we were able to do with no upfront cost um, so that's how we've been urging um different schools to go about it and the second step is to create a team of interested students teachers or other people in the school um, and one thing that our school did was um we had help from a climate to thrive which is an outside organization so if there's an organization near your school um that you think may be helpful for this um that would also be an approach to this, but creating a team is also a really important step um, because this is just a big project and having more people would make it easier and having more support as well. Um, and Ruby, if you wanna talk about the third step. Yeah, so it's also really important to find out um, how much your school is currently paying for electricity every year. Um, for a couple of reasons, but mainly it's another really good way to um, convince people that solar is a really good uh, project to undertake because you can say like, this is how much we're paying every year. And it's usually a lot more than you think. Um, and so if people hear that number then they're like, whoa, that's crazy. Why are we spending that much money? Like we need new textbooks. Um, and so you can make the argument that solar is going to actually save you a lot of money. Finding out how much you consume is also really important because then you can get an estimate of how many um, solar panels you'll need and what type of help you're gonna to need to get those. Yeah, and adding on um, like the physical way to do that is um, looking at your annual electricity bills. Um, 
and you can access that. There's usually like a person who's in charge of that in your school and you can either go to your principal and ask who, who's in charge of all the electric utility bills. Um, and they're usually monthly. So you'll need around 12, at least 12 of them and look through them and get like a ballpark estimate in kilowatt hours. Um, and Joe, if you could talk about um, identifying and talking with solar companies. Yes, um, the, there's, the landscape of solar in Maine has, changed, has been changing so rapidly, uh, especially with the onset of these kind of newer, more pro-solar legislation that, that happened in uh, 2019, or 2019 and 2020, um, because there, there were some players in the solar field right here. They're really good companies that do really great work, and they work throughout the state, a lot of them. Um, and then when all of this kind of new incentives for solar came in, there's big companies that are that operate nationally that are coming in to build larger um, arrays and find customers for them and everything so there's a whole mix of companies out there that either develop sites or, or put the panels on your roof uh, or on your grounds uh, and and then there's other ones that are just um, trying to find customers for existing community solar farms those of you I assume here everybody probably knows what a, com a community solar farm is. It's, it's not a farm. Um, sometimes it's on farmland, and that's not good. Um, but the it's a it's a large space that is covered with solar panels, and uh, that is one of the options. The I'll just say that on the Mount Desert Island uh, High School. There was a student before all of this that we've been talking about that um, took place said that we could power the school with solar energy, but it turned out that going rooftop uh, solar panels at that time was too expensive. But a few years later, it got cheaper, and then suddenly it was it was um, totally competitive. So putting panels on your roof is great if you have a good roof. It doesn't need to be refinished in, and replaced in the next 25 years. And we were fortunate at the high school that they had just done a lot of refinishing of the roofs and all that kind of stuff. There's a section that we they're going to do in another five years. So we did not put panels on that. Owning your own panels is, is a good thing um, because... Uh, the power is, is generated right there, and it's used right there uh, during the during the um, school year, etc. And, and in the summertime, it excess power is generated and it's sent out, and you're going to get credits for all of those. So um, the and with there's what, there's government incentives, of course, to to buy and use solar energy. See, right now it's a 26% tax credit. When we did it for the high school, it was a 30% tax credit. But since the school doesn't pay taxes, you, you go through what's called a power purchase agreement. And with that, it means that there's outside investors that actually own the system and they sell the power back to you at a discount. So. So we, that's how we did not have to put any money up. We just worked with a company who found investors. The investors own the system. The company builds the system. And we pay, um, we got about a third off of our electric bill for the first um, six years. And then after that, um, and this is a contract for 25 years, this power purchase agreement, but they, there's an op, the investors make their money by getting that tax credit themselves because they're a nonprofit, or I mean, they're for profit. And so they really don't need to hold on to that contract for 25 years. And as a result, they let you buy it at less than half the price after just six years. And this is a system that's going to last for 25 years. 
once the high school then buys the system, they'll get a bond for that and they'll pay monthly uh, payments on that. And those monthly payments will be far less than the electric bills that they were paying now, which is about $100,000 a year. Um, so we were able to save a lot of money that way, probably in the range of 25 to 30% um, with no money up down. Now, a slightly more expensive thing, if your roof doesn't work, is you could do a ground mounted system if you have land around your school that isn't being used for sports fields and other kinds of things and parking and everything. Um, you could do a ground array that supports the school. Um, and, and that's also a great option. It's probably going to be um, a little bit less savings because of the structure or the, the build to ground mount them. Um, and then the third option is a community solar farm. And community solar farm is where, like in Tremont, we use a capped landfill, and we, we built it there at the time we gave the permission to do that because they're benefiting from it. And uh, we put the array on there, and that's, that's providing electricity to the school um, or generating electricity that the school gets credited for. The today there's a lot of large uh, five megawatt um, solar farms going up that already exist or are existing, and there's companies that are looking for customers and schools as well as individuals and businesses can buy in to one of these solar farms. And, and actually, they could buy power from it. And the, the power that they buy from it is generated by that solar, of course. Um, and you get, generally speaking, about a 10 to 15% discount. Not quite as much savings as we're getting on the high school with owning our own panels after six years. But um, still, it's a significant difference. Uh, at our high school, that would have been ten to $15,000 a year savings. Um, and again, with no upfront cost. And the good news there is you don't have to worry about the roof leaking. You don't have to worry about um, you know what happens if the panels go bad and the maintenance of them and everything. It's all built into your contract that you just get the reduction in power. So those are the three ways that schools and or uh, businesses and or individuals can get solar uh, in this state. And you could go to the next slide and uh, if there is one. Uh, okay, yeah. yeah, thank you so much, Joe. So um, our we have two resources that will be extremely helpful um, if you are interested in taking this on um, at your school. And that is the solar white paper that um, Thomas and Sirohi, previous ACT interns, wrote and this solar white paper um, basically outlines um, the process that MDI went through um, to go 100% solar and um, it's really detailed and um, there's just a lot of information there but it's not too long super easy to read um, and the other resource we have is our solar roadmap um, um, which Acclimate to Thrive also put together for us. And that's more general, it has general steps that any school could follow and also includes templates for um, requests for proposal and other things. Um, and they're both really helpful. And if you're interested in this, um, I'll put my email in the chat and we can email you these resources. And also I believe they're on um, solarhighschool.com if you look that up online. And I think next slide. And yeah, so other than that, um, we hope to spend the last 20 ish minutes um, just doing Q&A. Um, if you guys have any questions. And um, again, like feel free to if you guys have any questions after um, this presentation, feel free to email me, Ruby or Joe. Um, yeah. Okay, so we'll take questions. Mm 
Be sure to unmute yourself. I have one question for Ayano and Ruby. Um, curious what else MDI Eco team is working on um, now, especially since you had this big win with um, with solar at MDI, just besides solar, what, what are you working on? Yeah, I don't know if I'll be able to name all of the projects so Ayano can correct me and add. Um, but one that I do know that's happening right now is um, MDI has gone back and forth um, with having a compost bin and cost compost system. Um, and so right now we don't have any composting ability. And so there's a committee that's trying to bring that back and maybe have um, a composting facility like on campus um, so we can deal with our own compost and not have to figure out a place to outsource it to. Um, there's, there's Project Legacy too, um, which was started last year by some outgoing seniors. Um, and it's basically an agreement, I think, with, I haven't worked on this as much, so it's, it's an agreement with the school um, where they promise to um, consider uh, the climate ramifications of every decision that they made, that they make um, going forward, um, as well as have um, more, um, have more, more information on climate change in science classes um, and more climate education, uh, as well as Maybe other things, Ayano, do you know more about that? Yeah, um, so that, yeah, Ruby, you basically summed it up for me, thank you. But um, I would say Project Legacy is like one of the biggest projects our eco team is taking up right now. Uh, and like um, most of the team is part of that. Whereas like only um, some members are a part of our project. Like we usually split it up, but Project Legacies basically like a climate emergency declaration, but for the school. It's like a commitment that the school will sign into um, to commit um, to make every decision like environmentally, to make environmentally conscious decisions um, when they're passing things in the school board or um, just trying to move towards carbon neutrality or um, carbon um, negative as a school by 2030, I believe. Um, but that's like an ongoing project that we're working with the principal on. And I believe we're presenting that um, in March to the school board. So this month um, to the school board, which is exciting. Um, thank you, Anya, for the question. And also, thank you so much, Mike. Um, I'm very excited about how where this project will go to. If anyone else has any other questions, feel free to unmute um, or type your question in the chat. How do you find the um, flat solar panels deal with snow in the winter? Um, Joe, do you want to take this one on or? Sure, yeah, I can. Um, that's a very interesting question. Very good question. Um, which I had at one point too. And I was at a conference and I was talking to a solar engineering company and they had a big display up and it showed a building in New England with, you know, flat roof panels all over the place. When we say flat roof panels, what they're really at a very minor slight um, slant, you know, like, I don't know, 5% or something. They're, they're slanted just enough to let water run off of them. But of course you have snow. And I said, so how do you do this? Exactly the question that you had. Um, and they said, solar energy is so cheap that when we calculate how much it's gonna cost for the year, we just block out December, January, and February and pretend that it's just covered with snow the whole time. And it still uh, is gonna save a lot of money. So that's how they do it. And the panels do get snow on them. They're very tough. Um, and they're, um, you know, the snow melts a little bit faster on those panels than it does on some things because they're black underneath. And once that melting process happens, it, it, it goes and they generate a little tiny bit of heat in there too, but not much. Um, but it, they, they might sit covered, you know, after a 
foot snowstorm for several days. And when you when they are covered, you get hardly any power from them. But the the way we price uh, and, and calculate whether solar works is based on they'll look at the whole year cycle and you're going to generate a lot of extra energy in the summertime, especially in a school because it's not being used much. Um, and all of that energy in Maine goes back into the grid and you get credit, a one-on-one -on -one credit, one-to-one -one credit for that energy um, or nearly a one-to-one -one credit. And in the wintertime, when your panels are not producing as much, you get to use all those credits up and it, it's designed, you know, figured so that it'll balance itself over the year. That's it. Other questions? Yeah, thanks, Joe. Um, John asked in the chat if there were any plans for recycling or repurposing our solar panels after 25 years. And I actually don't know the answer to that question. Do either of you guys? Yes, I, I can speak to that too. There was a good article that just came out uh, a couple of weeks ago, how that um, doesn't seem to be an issue because we live on a planet with 8 billion people. And, you know, people, it's the, the, if you take a typical panel, the size has stayed the same for the last 10 or 15 years, the physical inch by inch size of a panel, but the output of that panel just keeps getting better and better and better. When we put our panels on, they were around 300 kilowatts rated to produce 300 kilowatts of power when on the sun's hitting them. That same size panel right now would probably go on our roof at 400 kilowatts. So already our system, which does more than we need, um, is is I, we could have done with with a quarter less panels with with new panels today. So at some point, a business or a, a homeowner or a school might decide, you know, these panels are kind of really inefficient compared to what we have today. So why don't we? And they're so cheap to buy new ones. Why don't we just replace them? Well, they're going to last for 40 years. Um, the 25 years is just the absolute warranty that they guarantee, you know, uh, guarantee that they're going to be producing a significant amount of power. So if they're not good for you, they're good for somebody who doesn't have as much money as you <laughs> that could buy these used panels and put them up and still generate a lot of power for themselves. Um, and that goes all the way down, down the line to, you know, sending them over to third world countries that, can't afford to buy brand new panels. And so what they're finding is there's a big market for panels right now. So then it uh, leads to the question, what happens after 40 years? Um, they, they can be recycled just like uh, electronics are. And there, it's very, very, there's already people doing that um, by, you know, removing some of the heavy metals in there and things like that. But uh, that's going to grow in, because solar, the amount of solar panels is huge. And so like aluminum cans, you've got a good recycling program for that because it's, it's, um, uh, but you know, that's all going to depend on people making sure they get it to the right place. That's all. Another question. Yeah. Thank you, um, John, for asking that question and Joe for answering it. And um, Mark, you made a comment about seeing GSA as an interested um, school on our list. And it's um, GSA was one of like the first schools that we got in contact with. And I remember working, I remember GSA, I don't remember all working with all of the schools just because there's a lot. Um, but um, there's this one student, her name is Magnolia Vandiver. And I believe that's how to pronounce it. Um, but she was like the leader um, in bringing solar to her school. And they're actually really far along in the process right now. Um, I, we met with them a couple times um, and like shared resources, um, gave guidance. And I believe they're at the stage where they're bringing it to the school board now, um, which is awesome. Yeah. Um, yeah, GSA has been great to work with. 
yeah, um, I'm really excited to hear how that's going too. I think um, I'll reach out pretty soon and see how, if they have yet or, and how, if so, how it went, um, but yeah. And that's like one of the best, oh, sorry. Oh, no, go ahead. I was just gonna add like, that's one of the best parts about um, um, like this project is connecting with so many schools. Um, I've met like so many other students who are also passionate about like renewable energy and um, the climate crisis and dealing with it. Um, and again, like it's kind of funny because if the pandemic didn't happen, this wouldn't be such an easy project to do because like now that everything's over Zoom, like we're able to connect with all these schools um, super easily. And um, I'm able to meet so many youth across the state and hear about what their eco team is doing and um, how things are going with um, their team. And so that's like really encouraging and cool. Joe, sorry. Samantha, I think, oh, sorry. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> I was just gonna say that I saw Samantha uh, raise her hand, but I'm not sure if there's Yeah, no, that was, there. that was an accidental hand raise. Sorry. Okay, okay, Thanks, cool. Guys. I just wanted to check in. Um, yeah, Joe, what were you gonna say? Oh, I was just going to say, are there any thoughts? Uh, it doesn't have to be a question. It could just be uh, thoughts about how solar is progressing. Because as I said, it is the landscape has changing tremendously. Some of you probably seen in the paper about how CMP um, was having difficulty because the grid isn't really up to going um, hugely <laughs> solar, you know? Uh, it's a, an old grid that was, you know, built a hundred years ago and upgraded in 1970 or something, but it's, uh, there's so much work that needs to be done. So the state is grappling with um, exactly who's going to pay for that, how that's going to get done right now. And uh, we have to kind of move cautiously towards full expansion <laughs> because it, without the grid, we would just go nuts with solar right now because it is the cheapest way to produce energy. Um, but anybody have any thoughts or other questions along these lines about solar or the high school project? Um, I think, sorry, um, I was just gonna say, John um, asked another question in the chat. Joe, if you wanna answer it, he says, um, how much more expensive is covering parking lots with solar? Okay. Um, yeah, if any of you have ever been down to Brooklyn Whole Foods in New York, uh, you'll see that their parking lot is covered with, with these nice solar panels, and it also provides weather protection from the snow and rain for the cars underneath. And I love that idea, and I thought that was really great. It, the solar energy is the cheapest form of energy, but if you have to build – these large steel or aluminum frames to hold the panel up that high, uh, that adds a lot of cost per kilowatt to it. And, and so far that, you know, that has not been um, cost productive. A ground mount, a typical ground mount where they're closer to the ground and there's a, a steel or aluminum framing structure that holds the panels is much smaller and that works. So the Tremont landfill has that, but it's a lot more expensive to do a parking lot. If it's you know a private uh, home or a small business or something like that, you might do that just for the you know to, to be able to say, "Wow, look at this! We've got our panels, and they're protecting us from the rain and the snow." So I was just going to chime in that in the middle of this presentation, I got a breaking news alert that, um, oh, what are they called? Summit, the natural gas company that was looking to do the um, natural gas pipeline along the midcoast has pulled their plans for that, which I think is good news as a, as a new um, energy consumer and I'm getting ready to renovate my house, I was actually excited when I first heard about um, Summit coming because I thought, oh, natural gas, it's cleaner than those disgusting fuel oil tanks. 
and that would be great. And then the more I learned about it, I, I realized um, some of the issues with natural gas. So we're actually looking at um, putting, so we have to replace the roof on our house anyway. So we're gonna do solar and switch to heat pumps and all that, which I'm very excited about um, just on a personal level, but a little breaking news. <laughs> That's, that's great. Heat pumps, that, that is a really big uh, thing. You know, solar is great and it's kind of, you know, sexy in a way, you know, it's like, wow, we're making energy from the sun. But energy efficiency is really number one. And heating with electricity is um, a really big trend and something that's needed. So an efficiency main offers great rebates right now on heat pumps and and so forth, and also on electric vehicles. And so really the future for most people that are trying to get away from fossil fuels is electricity. It's electricity to run your car, electricity to heat your home, et cetera. And Maine is the number one state in the union that's most oil dependent for home heating. And so there's a big push to turn everybody over to heat pumps. And we love our heat pumps. Um, it's been really great. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm excited to try it out. We, ha we have an electric vehicle as well. Um, and I just, you know, part of what I'm thinking is if we can get the solar on our house and set up the heat pumps and we've got our nice electric vehicle parked out front, yeah. I, I'm hoping that the neighbors will follow suit too and see, you know, lead by example. Yeah, absolutely. We have people stop by all the time and ask about the panels. <laughs> Um, Samantha, I'm just linking in the chat a link to a one pager that Sierra Club did on that fracked gas pipeline, and it also has some more info about fracked gas and natural gas in general, and also some alternatives. And great, I, yeah, I, I want to talk actually, about is heat pumps. <laughs> I may have read about it and read that in the past week. I've been doing a lot of reading since I first saw Summit, and then you know saw the local response to it. So thank you. I'll look at it. All right. Um, I, I'm sorry. I'm sorry to cut this um, good conversation off, but it is past one o'clock and I know everyone has um, places to go. Well, and I just want to say thank you again so much for um, coming today and listening to our presentation. Um, it means so much to have this support. And again, if you have any questions, um, please feel free to email me. I put my email in the chat or Joe or Ruby. Um, thank you guys. <laughs> yeah, thank you guys so much. This has been great. Thank you.